Hi, everyone. I'm Maggie McGrath, editor of Forbes Women. Abortion and reproductive rights are going to be one of the biggest issues in the upcoming presidential election. Joining us now to talk about the state-by-state -state abortion restrictions and ballot initiatives is Regina Davis Moss. She is the president and CEO of In Our Own Voice, the National Black Women's Reproductive Justice Agenda. Regina, thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much for having me. So it's been a very busy week for reproductive health news. On Monday, we saw the Supreme Court fail to intervene in Texas's rule preventing emergency abortions in that state. On Tuesday, or late Monday actually, Georgia was going back and forth on its abortion ban. And today there was a hearing in North Dakota around that state's abortion ban. What do you have your eye on? And of these pieces of news, is there one that's popping to the forefront more than another? Well, in all cases, my eye is on the people that it impacts most. And those are the people that have to deal with the flip-flop, that have to try to contend with, wait a minute, you know what? I got one week to try to make this happen because as you know, that makes a, a huge difference, right? If you can you know, go to um, have this procedure in your state as opposed to having to travel across lines, that saves a lot of money. Um, so those are just, few of the issues that I don't think people appreciate um, when you're really stressed out and already overwhelmed and you're trying to navigate these laws, um, how overwhelming and perpetually you're stressed you are. The other thing that we're also focused on is saying we knew these decisions like these were going to happen. We knew we have black women have been sounding the alarm bell on this for a long time. These extreme lawmakers and these judges, you know, that have been appointed, they're just determined to strip of, us, of our bodily autonomy. Um, and so we're constantly trying to say, you know what? We're not gonna stand for that. Um, we are lifting our voices around. They are just trying to take away our agency at every turn. And then we're also making sure people understand that when it comes to black women, we consider this a direct attack on our bodies, our health, our life, and our safety. A direct attack on bodies, health, life, and safety. Can you talk a little bit more about that? And what are you hearing from the women you talk to? Are you mostly talking to patients seeking care, or are you hearing from doctors in states affected by the bans who are confused by the endless litigation and back and forth on some of these policies? Yeah, I mean, I'm hearing from all of them because that's what In Our Own Voice does. We are focused on policy change and shifts and we are centering black women, girls, and gender expansive people. So when I talk about how it impacts our life, number one, I'm trying to help people understand, uh, number one, I'm trying to help people appreciate that this conversation is so much larger than abortion, right? When you are having to have that personal and uh, very consequential decision about whether or not to continue an unattended pregnancy, there's a lot of things you're talking about. You thought you were talking about things like, can I keep my job? Can I stay in school? Am I going to be able to, um, is it, it, you know, am I going to be able to survive, number one, for black women? Because we know the maternal mortality rates are off the charts, right? And it doesn't matter whether or not you have a good paying job or you, and you have the best quality of care, right? Is it an increased risk for my infant? You know, there's so many questions that we're talking about when we say that impacts your life and it impacts your safety and your health. Not to mention when that child comes into this world, I wanna be able to raise that child in a safe and sustainable environment. So I'm worried about things like safe communities and gun violence and quality education in schools. All of those things have an impact on our lives. All of the, and, and when you take away somebody's decision-making ability to be self-determining about their reproductive lives, that's what we mean when we talk about autonomy. When you talk to your community, is there a state abortion ban or a recent development? I'm thinking of we've seen some deaths of mothers, people who were already mothers who were pregnant, seeking care, and because of certain state restrictions, they lost their lives. What concerns your community the most? I recognize a lot of this is very concerning, but is there a specific incident that you're hearing about over and over and over again? Well, you know, we do polling, right? And so one of the questions we ask black women 
um, 18 years and older, was how do you feel after the Dobbs decision? And they have said that it impacts their lives in real and threatening ways. You know, number one, they're concerned about things like being criminalized for something related to pregnancy because they saw what happened in Ohio. And now we've seen what happened has happened in Georgia with two women that were already mothers who were afraid to go to the emergency department or in one case was afraid to go in another case, sought care and got caught up in that system. You asked about like what we're hearing about from healthcare providers. That's exactly it. That there's, it's not, you know, people think it's just one doctor can make this decision. You know, if in a case of Amber Nicole Thurman, that required an anesthesiologist, that required nurses, a lot of people to intervene. And if there was just one person in that cascade of care that she needed that didn't want to, was afraid for their livelihood. No, we're not just talking about people losing their job. We're talking about people that went to school because they took an oath because they believe in saving people being afraid to go to jail. So if that happened, if one just one person feels that way, then that person doesn't get treatment, right? And then we're just, you know, there's just this chaos around whether we're, you know, um, Intala and whether or not, you know, a, a federal law should take higher precedence than a state law. And I, I just want to remind people that the law was put in place because they were saying that you must provide stabilizing care regardless of a pers person's ability to pay or if they have insurance. So like, let's take a look at what stabilizing care is, right? So you hurt yourself and you go to the emergency department or maybe you are fortunate enough to have urgent care in your community. The job is to stabilize you so that you can get continuation of care or in some cases, if you are near death to save your life. So that's the law. Right. And now what we're dealing with is these extreme lawmakers playing around with that. Right. So we these are people's lives that are in the balance of people nuance language, which was not the intent of it. The intent was because we knew people were being literally dumped. It, it's called a dumping statute because people were being turned away. Why are we, if that is what we were planning to do was to protect people, how are we protecting people now when we know they're near death? When we're telling people, you know what, go wait in the parking lot until you're, you know, at sepsis at a crisis rate and then come back in and then I can intervene because people are afraid. What do you say to people who would say, oh, that's too extreme. No doctor would tell someone to go wait in the parking lot until they're septic. What's your response to those who doubt what is happening in the news? I would tell you that this, uh, this, is, this is sadly the truth, that that's exactly what is happening, that doctors are not callous, uh, they're not heartless, but this is their hands are tied. And so the only way to protect themselves and sometimes the, the larger systems and even these women, right? Because People, you know, in the case of the woman in Ohio, she went to jail for a miscarriage, is to make it so that there's no question that they had to intervene, right? So I, I would, you know, the larger issues that I want people to understand is that this is not a game and this is not a joke and that you have extreme lawmakers that are intent on expanding this across the country, right? If you if you are very, um, sorry, intent on expanding this type of treatment and this type of approach across the country, and if you care about saving a, a loved one, then it's, you have to take this seriously. You cannot disregard this and say that this is not true and this is an exaggeration. And in terms of practical steps, what does take this seriously mean? Are you working on get out the vote campaigns? Are you working on any of the abortion ballot initiatives across the state, across the many states in the U.S.? What's what's your uh, action list? Yeah, you know, we're, we're doing all of it. So in our own voice, we're a powerful network of extremely motivated black women led organizations in 12 states. We're focused on protecting bodily autonomy, like I talked about, and securing our rights. And so we do that through our proactive policy. We do we release a policy agenda that is a landmark guidebook on how to do this type of work. 
We are in the communities with our voter education efforts. Um, we are not just telling people to get out the vote, but we're encouraging people to examine um, the, the records of some of these uh, people that you place in office. You know, when we do our polling, we know that women of color, um, their voting choices are largely driven by their feelings about how policies impact their lives, the needs that they have, um, the changes that they need in their community and their values. And the only way you can put somebody in office that reflects your needs, values and views is to become educated. So we encourage people to become educated and then we vote. And after you vote, you hold those people accountable, right? It's not just enough to put somebody in office. You've got to hold them accountable. So those that's what we do. And we're doing that in all states. We're doing that even in important election year at the national level, but in every year. Because another thing people need to appreciate is that a lot of the policies and the things that impact us most don't always get decided upon by the president. They are decided upon by people like on your school board, people that sit on your library boards, people who um, decide what kind of school curriculum your, your, your children are being taught. And all of those things are decided down the ballot. Mm -hmm. When you talk about down ballot initiatives, I think of some of the local state by state abortion ballot measures that we saw in the aftermath of the Dobbs decision. And a lot of those abortion measures were very successful. As you look at the ballot initiatives that will occur in November, are you optimistic? Will each one succeed or are we looking at a split a split map scenario here? What's your projection? Well, you know, I think with these ballot measures and what we've seen so far is that people are sending a pretty clear message. And that message is that we don't want people legislating our personal decisions. It shouldn't depend on your zip code or your state and the types of freedom and access to resources that you need to be able to survive. So I'm optimistic that people will choose themselves uh, you know, over ideology. Um, but, you know, the, the only way we can make sure that that happens is to turn out and vote and make sure make your voice heard. One of the states that will see abortion on the ballot is Florida. And of course, Florida was hit hard by Hurricane Helene, was hit hard by Milton, which is still making its way across the state. There's a tremendous amount of damage and debris. Regina, do you worry about these natural disasters affecting people's ability to go to the polls? I mean, we've heard those concerns in North Carolina, which saw mudslides and, and flooding after Helene. Will these states be recovered by Election Day? I, I, I don't know, but, you know, if they'll be recovered. But I do worry because, you know what I care about most? I care about a free and fair democracy. It doesn't matter what side of the aisle you sit on, right? That's the beauty of this country is that you be, you're you able to exercise your vote by doing that. So yeah, I worry about that. Um, I mean, I am talking to people in these states. I you know, talk about reproductive justice and one of those things that we talk about is having access to quality care. And you know, I'm talking to people that are having to have their insulin droned in to places in North Carolina. Um, so, you know, we, this, this is dire. Um, that is being able, one of the core things that I talk about is being able to thrive and be able to raise a ch your children in safe and sustainable communities. And when we have these catastrophic, you know, weather related events happen, it, it, it really doesn't, it's no respecter of your political ideology. We're all impacted. Now, the beautiful thing is that we see people come together you, that's an American way is in a time of crisis, we, we do band together. But the question is, when we do that, are we at that point able to really center on like what is needed most? And then what, how do we move from that to action? And how do we make that reflective in our policies? Now, last week, there were reports that Melania Trump's memoir s said that she supported abortion rights. And between those comments and, and certain softening comments from J.D. Vance and former President Trump his, himself, there have been headlines indicating that the GOP is, quote unquote, softening its stance on abortion. Do you agree with this? Do you think 
those are steps in the right direction or is it political posturing? I don't I don't t- <laughs> pretend to try to understand the thinking at the time. What, what I do know is what do the facts say, right? Whether you look at our polls, which are all black women, or you look at women of color polls that I've done with my colleagues in Latin A and AAPI communities. And I will say by the large share that people find it are more likely to support a candidate that supports abortion rights and access, right? But I also want to say that just as as important as it is to have access to abortion is you got to be able to afford it. So you got to have the coverage and you have to be able to um, be able to access it without criminalization and also be able to access it in your community. So all of those issues are important. As you look at the polling that your organization has done and the conversations that you yourself have had with the community, what's your sense of their reception of Vice President Kamala Harris? Is she talking about reproductive justice enough? And if not, what more does she need to say? Yes, Vice President Harris has actually talked about reproductive justice. And when you look at her track record, you will notice that she's actually championed some of those issues. One of the things she did while she was a senator was to talk about the momnibus, which is one of the most comprehensive pieces of legislation that gets at addressing maternal mortality. She's actually named reproductive justice, which is different from reproductive freedom and reproductive rights and reproductive liberty. She gets that. And you know what? I'm not even looking at the candidate so much as I'm looking at there's two uh, two different camps in terms of one that wants to protect our rights, our autonomy, and our decision-making ability, and one that wants to take it away. We've covered a lot of ground, and like I started this conversation, there's been a lot of news on reproductive health this week. Is there anything else on your mind, something that you are dealing with on a day-to-day basis that the media is not talking about when it comes to reproductive justice? You know, I started in the beginning of our conversation talking about this, which is that when we have these extreme policies in place, that there's ultimately somebody or groups of people that are left behind, that are deeply impacted. We talked about Georgia, we talked about Texas. There are nearly 2 million black women of reproductive age in those states. Georgia, Texas, and Florida have the largest majority of black women in the United States in reproductive age. So these laws, they're dangerous. They're taking us backwards. They're depriving people of that stabilizing medical care that is a federal law. We need that, we deserve it. And if we don't, more people are gonna continue to die deaths that are preventable. Regina Davis Moss, President and CEO of In Our Own Voice, National Black Woman Reproductive Justice Agenda. Thank you so much for joining us. We so appreciate your time and your perspective. Thanks so much for having me.